uh, Noah, and good afternoon to everyone. This book, Nation to Nation, that uh, we contribute to is making an important contribution to historiography because of its critical thought, because of the way it addresses treaty issues. And I think it does so in a more comprehensive fashion than any other study I've seen. So I compliment Suzanne for envisioning this book and the, the results of it and all of its contributors. The, um, the uh, uh, paradigm that I come from is that of an American Indian study scholar. I was trained as a historian, but I've shed that uh, um, training, I hope, to develop a more comprehensive view of uh, looking at uh, the way that uh, Native societies uh, have struggled uh, to maintain sacred ways of life that were given to them by our creators. And uh, one of the uh, um, things we do in American Indian studies is that we, we uh, um, privilege oral history, as, uh, as Jennifer was, was talking about her, her family stories. You know, that is important to us because those uh, accounts are often not written. And if we did not include oral history into our work, then we would be missing a whole lot of the story. We also defend our sovereignty, our land, our human rights, our religious freedom, our health, our well-being. These are things that no other discipline uh, does to my knowledge. Um, when uh, Susan Miller and myself co-authored a book uh, several years ago, we identified six principles that, uh, that, uh, representative, that are representative of indigenous intellectual thought. And one is sovereignty is inherent and it predates the U.S. Constitution. Two, lands uh, that were taken from us were done so through, uh, uh, through serial acts of duplicity, violence, deceit, coercion, and that's not to take away from the treaty making process. You know, our leaders were determined to do what was best for our people. Uh, the third is that doctrine of discovery is rooted in a racially based fictive concept that is based on a notion of white superiority and Indian inferiority. Four, that the colonizers used use the language of racism to justify its horrendous acts against us. Five, 19th century discourses of colonialism are entrenched in contemporary academic and legal thought. And six, colonialism is a crime against humanity. So this is our struggle. And uh, uh, in my paper, I tried to deal with some of these issues. And uh, I was asked uh, to write uh, on Pawnee treaties, and I think 2,500 words or 3,000 words, something like that. How can I do that? So uh, I, the first draft ended up about 6,000 words and was able to pare it down. But anyways, uh, what I've done in my presentation, I've, I've put together some photos that are, are in that book chapter that uh, I'll use as talking points about uh, uh, my, my, my chapter. Um, this individual, Arusataka, um, was a Pawnee scout. And he symbolizes the loyalty of our people to the US government. Beginning in 1864, Pawnees sent hundreds of our young men off to war fighting against economy, uh, common enemy nations. And uh, our, our scouts uh, are revered today as our, our, our veterans. Myself, I'm a uh, fourth generation veteran. And within my family, uh, we have been in every branch of the US military. My dad was in the Coast Guard. My brother and I were both in the Navy. Um, three uncles were. Um, in the army and my great grandfather was a scout. Anyways, um, uh, so this is the, the, the subtitle of my, or the title of my uh, um, uh, author, uh, excuse me, my chapter is Betrayal. And you know, we allied, the Pawnees allied ourselves to the United States government, and yet we were treated as conquered enemies over time. And that didn't take long for that uh, time to occur. It happened fairly quickly. There, uh, oops. Okay. And, this, this is a map of the Pawnee homelands. And uh, th what this map represents is what the struggles were all about, land. Land, land, land. The incoming white Americans wanted land, and we had that land. And uh, the way that uh, the uh, government wanted to take that land was by treaties. Uh, so these treaties that I look at in my study are two, the 1833 treaty and the 18. 57 treaty because both of these treaties have um, assimilation uh, provisions. But that is not to say that the Pawnees ever consented to the eradication of the traditional Pawnee way of life. 
They did not. And this is uh, uh, Peter Desaru, uh, our man chief. He um, was one of the negotiators of the uh, 1857 treaty. He came here to Washington, D.C., uh, and I believe this is where this picture was taken, uh, to uh, um, wait for Congress to, to ratify this treaty. So as a chief, his responsibility was to care for the, for the well-being of the people, to ensure that the future of the Pawnee way of life continued forever, that those traditional ways of doing things, the, the religion, the making uh, of sacrifices of, of animal parts to the creator, the growing of mother corn, maintaining the cohesion of our mud lodge towns, were all a part of, of, of uh, his responsibility and those chiefs who also signed that 1833 treaty. So um, these chiefs uh, did the best that they could in, in these negotiations. He was actually, uh, uh, he died from a, a gunshot wound when the Pawnees were uh, about to be removed to Oklahoma in 1874. And my family traditions say that, uh, that someone shot him as he was in the Platte River in the lake and he later died from, uh, from uh, gangrene. Uh, and this is um, uh, a scene of a, a Pawnee mud lodge town at Genoa, Nebraska. I believe that uh, Suzanne's uh, great great grandmother was uh, born here. She doesn't ever mention she's Pawnee, except to a few of us Pawnees. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's good to hear that uh, that connection is there. But you know, can you imagine the, the richness of life in these settings, these, these villages? And uh, this is a. Uh, I believe this is a, a annuity distribution that came from the 1857 treaty. Do we have any Pawnees in the, the uh, audience besides uh, Kevin and myself? Well, we're like the, uh, like the uh, Tuscaroras. We get uh, something from the federal government every year from our 1857 treaty. We get money, not cloth. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think our, uh, our check this year will probably be about $10 a person. It's a, it's a, a per, per, per cap payment. Uh, the amount was uh, $30,000 in perpetuity. And you know, there's a principle, no matter how small that is, we need to keep that money coming in because it shows that this treaty is still important to us. So uh, this is what the federal policy of assimilation was trying to do, was destroy this way of life, to move the people from these towns and make them live like white American farmers, the yeoman farmer, making a living off the land, you know, like the Jeffersonian uh, vision of America. And these are who were targeted, the children. In the 1833 treaty, um, provisions were made for uh, school, and then in, again in the 1857 treaty. In the 1833 treaty, the, the funding for the school was only last 10 years. Can you imagine that the federal government thought it could totally eradicate Pawnee culture in 10 years? It was an utter failure. But uh, uh, missionaries came out, so uh, you know there was a there was a compromise of the. Um, of the church and state uh, doctrine by uh, the federal government funding uh, missionaries and uh, allowing missionaries to come into to Indian country uh, to, uh, to, do their, uh, to do their conversion work. So uh, in, um, in uh, the first uh, treaty, the very little, very few uh, Pawnees were subjected to this educational system. Language barriers came into play and the Pawnees had to simply had to carry out a way of life and one of the uh, troubling aspects of that 1833 treaty, if you read the chapter, is that, uh, is that the treaty says that the Pawnees had agreed to move, all Pawnees agreed to move north of the Platte River and protect the uh, uh, people who would come there as a part of that assimilation program. Well, the Pawnees uh, culture or custom, yeah, culture was, was based upon hunting and agriculture. So twice a year, Pawnees went to hunt, but the federal government expected them to stay put for a year, which would essentially be, uh, be a death warrant if the Pawnees did that and realized that, so they had to uh, uh, continue the hunting. So uh, anyways, the federal government bent on this one later on uh, and allowed the, the, uh, uh, the setup of this assimilation program. Uh, then some Pawnees, but not all, began to move across the, uh, across the Platte River to uh, be a part of it. But again, there was no, uh, 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 consensus amongst the Pawnees and the Pawnees about the nature of the treaty, I should say, and that the, uh, um, that the, the uh, parents of these children who were in these schools did not want their children to lose their Pawnee way of life. And uh, another aspect of the treaty was uh, uh, 
1857 treaty was that uh, the uh, Pawnees agreed to turn over any Pawnees who committed crimes against white people. Well, the treaty doesn't say anything about turning whites over to Pawnees who committed crimes against Pawnees, and there, were much more, there was much more criminality being committed by whites against Indians uh, and Pawnees uh, in, in my study. And this is an, an individual, uh, yellow son, in this uh, photograph. He was a, about a 70-year-old uh, doctor, and, uh, which what we, uh, we called our, our, our medicine man. And he was accused, along with some other Pawnees, of uh, killing a white settler. And um, uh, there was very little evidence about who killed this settler. But the uh, uh, whites thought that the Pawnees had. So the, uh, the uh, Quaker agents who had taken charge of the Pawnee Reservation in 1869 invoked that provision of the 1857 treaty. And what they did is that they withheld annuity good distributions until the Pawnees turned over someone for the murder of this white settler. So the Pawnees were starving at that time. And this is how the US government used this treaty, was to force the Pawnees to give up somebody by starving them. And they also took the chiefs, Pita de Saru and other chiefs, hostage to try to get the chiefs to force these individuals to, uh, um, to uh, turn over uh, the killers of uh, this settler named McMurty. Well, they were tried in federal district court and they were uh, uh, convicted. But then a U.S. judge, uh, uh, Dundee, uh, held that uh, because the uh, crime had happened off the reservation, the federal government did, have not, did not have jurisdiction over the matter. So these uh, individuals were uh, uh, turned over to the state and the state uh, later um, dropped charges because they couldn't find anyone who would testify against them. Uh, so victims, you know, the, the women, you know, uh, these were uh, very important to our culture as well, as, uh, for the same reasons as uh, Jennifer was talking about with Diné. But, uh, you know, it was a, the plan was to, to get them out of their Indian dress, to make them dress more like white Americans, speak like white Americans. Uh, they would not uh, pass on the traditions to the children. Um, and here uh, is another uh, image that I, that's not in the book, but one I put together. And these are uh, code talker medals uh, uh, that were given to the uh, um, families of nine Pawnees who were uh, called code talkers during the Second World War. Uh, Kevin Gover's uh, grandfather was one of them, and his uncle, his, uh, excuse me, his other grandfather. You know, in Pawnee ways, we don't have uncles or cousins. We have brothers and sisters, uh, dads and moms. Uh, and grandparents in, in our terminology. Um, uh, his other grandfather, Grant, was uh, killed in, uh, in um, um, Italy, I believe it was, northern Italy. So, uh, you know, again, this, uh, em uh, this image shows, you know, that we, we remain committed to, uh, to providing military service, and I think we need to rethink that sometimes uh, about why we do it. Uh, anyways, uh, 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 this last July, at Pawnee during our Pawnee homecoming, which um, started right after the Second World War to bring uh, veterans back uh, to Pawnee. Um, we honored those families and those code talkers with an event at our roundhouse. We had a traditional feed. We had speakers, actually a, a, a general who was once the commander of the 45th Division, a lieutenant colonel who is um, uh, still a part of it. Uh, and several of us other people spoke about, uh, about the scouts. Uh, about these uh, code talkers and, and their legacy. Okay, uh, I got the five minute notice <laughs> and believe it or not, I'm done. <laughs> First time I haven't had a hook, <laughs> pull me off. <laughs> <laughs>